Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Governor, uh, Chief Guest, it's a real honor to be here this evening to be giving this lecture uh, uh, in memory of uh, Zayed Hussein, who obviously uh, I, I never got to meet, but seeing that video uh, showed us all, I think, just what an important figure he was in, uh, in, in Pakistan's history. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, state capacities, which is a topic I've been working on for quite a while now. Um, and to some extent, what I'm going to offer you are um, quite broad reflections on what I think we've learned in a research program that I started uh, about 10 years ago, which combines insights not just from economics, I mean, I was trained as an economist, um, but uh, since then I've got interested in politics and political economy, and the, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is equally uh, drawing on patterns in history. Indeed, I've come to believe that no one social science is really able to deliver the kinds of insights we need into what drives long-run growth and development. That one needs an integrated approach, and I hope today I'll have the opportunity to describe what that approach looks like and offer something that could be helpful uh, uh, to, to you here. So let me uh, start in the beginning, <laughs> natural place, but in terms of what we taught generations of students about economic growth. And when we said what drives growth and what drives economic success, we make a series of obvious points. You need more skills in the economy. You need plant, machinery, structures, infrastructure. And you need technology. And to be a modern economy operating on the frontier, you need all of these. Um, and these accumulation processes, if we think of growth, is the process by which you augment the stocks of these and bring them into production. And they inter they're very interrelated. So, for example, skills are needed to operate the best technology. Um, often you need infrastructure. For example, di digital infrastructure is increasingly important to be on the technology frontier. So these things are all interrelated. So this is just the traditional thing that we teach our students when we start to teach them about economic growth. Now, a recent theme, and I think very much the theme that lies behind what I'm going to talk about this evening, is saying that all of these ingredients that you need to be an effective and modern economy, behind it all lies a set of presumptions about what government does. Government is an absolutely central player. And economists have, from time to time, been in somewhat in denial. There are many people out there who've talked about the minimal state. Let's just let the market get on with it. But by and large, economists have had a lot of unwritten assumptions, I would say, about what it is the state does. And part of what I want to do in this presentation is to bring out some of the unwritten assumptions, put them on the table, and let us think about how important they are, and then what we can learn from that for policy. So I want to talk about a type of capital accumulation. So I want to stay, in a certain sense, in a very traditional part of economics. All of the things, skills, technology, capital, accumulate. Well, I want to talk about another kind of capital, um, which I argue lies at the heart of thinking about government effectiveness. And the term that we're using in this research program is this term, state capacities. And I'll be clear what I mean by state capacities as the lecture progresses. But these are forms of capital which are absolutely essential to an efficient and effective government and uh, make government work more effectively. What I want to try and offer you is some insights into the factors that generate state capacities, what we've learned from history and what we've learned from contemporary experience. And although I'm not an expert, indeed I wouldn't claim to be an expert for one minute, I hope that I'll be able to at least frame debates in a way that will be useful to uh, the kinds of policy challenges that you face in Pakistan. So here's uh, a picture of the starting point, uh, a, a map of the world uh, where countries um, that are worse performing than Pakistan are in red, 
and those that are better performing are in green. That'll be a consistent pattern in these pictures. You'll have seen these in the lobby as you came in, these various maps rotating around in a presentation. And this comes from uh, the uh, book, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in, in a minute with Torsten Persson. Um, and essentially what you see is this is just an index of income. So these are income levels. I'm sure you're used to seeing maps like this and pictures like this, which essentially show that around 47 countries perform more poorly than Pakistan on standard income per capita measures, and around 100 countries perform better than Pakistan. Now, of course, one, one has to be wary of these numbers. There's lots of debates about exactly how to do cross-national comparisons. But I want to just put this as a sort of starting point. This is the kind of challenge that one looks at and says, well, how can one move up one's performance? Any country on this list would be thinking about it. Even in Britain, we now have endless debates about growth. The whole challenge of growth in the post-2008 world since the financial crisis is a challenge that's not just unique to Pakistan or to the developing world. It's a real challenge across the globe. So what am I going to do in the lecture? I'm going to talk a bit more about the background issues, but then I'm going to be the focal point, and what I really want to introduce you to is a framework for thinking about state capacities. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is one of the key things we've learned in this research program about what drives long-run state capacities. And I'm going to talk about that, and for the moment, the terminology may be a little mysterious, but I hope that uh, without too much delay, you'll come to see what I mean by this concept of executive constraints lying right at the heart of what drives uh, state capacity and many other things that we care about in the growth process. The beginnings of this work lie in a series of academic papers. So this all began life as sort of more or less standard stuff that economists, academic economists do, which is to write and publish papers and go around and make presentations. But as our work has progressed, we've realized that there are really uh, useful, we believe, useful lessons for policy and thinking in the framework we've developed. So um, the book that particularly pulls together these ideas was a book that uh, I think is available uh, outside. Um, and uh, it's called Pillars of Prosperity, The Political Economics of Development Clusters. What we mean by development clusters here is what we noticed when we started looking at patterns of state capacity was how they tended to go together in a particular way. And that's what we call clustering, and I'll be clear about that in uh, a few moments. The work began really by trying to understand how did the modern state develop. Now, it's something that those of us who live in Europe I think almost take for granted that we have states that raise revenue, they tax people, they provide health services, education services. But with, I, I realized that within the social science that I knew, there was not a strong intellectual framework for answering the question, well, how did you ever get to that point? Uh, and really what we've been trying to provide through this research is a better understanding of how states have evolved what have been the key forces? What are the key elements of that? And what can that tell us about policy and development? That's really the, the bigger picture. Um, we've come to believe, as I say, that this, I, this notion of state capacity is what you need to unlock some of those. And we also realized, and this was something that occurred to us about 30%, I suppose, into this research program, that we could have a framework that also embraced some of the debates about peace and security and the role of peace and security. And I'll come to that later in the, in the talk. Um, in order to understand this, the key concept, and it fits very much with the governor's message at the end of that video, is the idea of trying to build cohesion. Unity was the term that the, the governor used. But uh, Understanding what are the institutional frameworks that allow you to do that. In our subsequent research, because very much our, our book we viewed as a, as a work in progress. You know, it was one of those things, some people spend their whole careers writing a book that might take them 20 or 30 years. We were determined not to do that. We actually wrote this book in, I, in about six months, 
because we, we thought, well, unless we actually write the ideas down and distribute them and let people debate them, then people aren't, if we, even if we're wrong, people aren't going to tell us that. So we need, to, we need to get the ideas out there. So this was very much when we wrote a progress report. The reason I mention that is because the current work that we have been doing, and I will refer to this a little bit later, has been to try and understand things that were inevitably missing in that progress report. And one of those is the role of what we're calling nor norms and societal values. Again, that should be clearer as I develop the ideas. Okay, so I'm going to briefly review um, three strands of development thinking that lie behind what I'm going to talk about. And talk, and it'll give me an opportunity to talk about a little bit about the existing knowledge and things that have been said. And then I'll get into the sort of what I would regard as the relatively novel part of what it is we've, we've tried to achieve in this research program. For those of you who've ever studied any uh, models of economic growth, the name on that you would come across in your sort of first ever lecture would be the name of Robert Solo. Robert Solo was, uh, or is, uh, a, uh, a um, Nobel laureate in economics who was the first person to look at wrong run changes in income. And one thing that's been surprising, so what people now talk about the modern era of economic growth, or the hockey stick, and there's a really rather remarkable fact. I wish I, I probably should have brought this as a picture, which is a picture of the hockey stick. What is the hockey stick? As far as we know, human living standards barely increased at all until around 1800. There was a, basically a period of more or less flat living standards. And then what you see, and this is the hockey stick, is an upturn in living standards somewhere around 1800 in some parts of the world. And then gradually other parts of the world begin to catch up to different degrees with the very rapid increase in living standards. Modern economic growth is a phenomenon that's only about a little over 200 years old. And people have then debated endlessly, well, why did the world change about 200 and some years ago. What was different about the modern era of economic growth compared with the era before? Now what Solo noticed when he looked at American growth was that more or less you had a very, you had a, some component coming through the things, the standard things, capital accumulation, skills and so forth, but what you had was a very uh, more or less predictable rate of technological change, about 2%. Uh, economic growth every year. Um, and the question was then, where does technology come from? And people say, well, you need behind any effective and successful economy, you need, um, you, you, sorry, this is skipped ahead, you need um, uh, an, effective, uh, an effective government. There have been various attempts, therefore, to think about what if you, if you take the kind of standard model seriously, what's the role of the state and can you have effective state-led development? And of course we have countries which have really shone as examples of state-led development, China, South Korea, Taiwan and Singapore. But we also have many countries that have had much less success than them and we need to understand why it is that some countries apparently have been able to generate economic success through state-led development while others appear to have had much less success. And I, uh, what Torsten and I, when we began to think about this, thought, well, what's missing from this is a theory of why government sometimes intervenes more successfully than other times. Why is it that you can have successful state-led development in some situations and less so in others? So we began to think about this idea of state capacities and we thought, well, what have people written about this? Well, it occurred to us economists had simply assumed the answer. Or in, in, in effect, economists mostly just said, well, the government can intervene in the economy, but they didn't really explain, well, why it wouldn't have intervene effectively. There was almost nothing written about the absence of effective government intervention. Outside of economics, it was rather different. And we were drawn immediately, and this is where we discovered the, firm, the term state capacity being used to historical sociological accounts of the rise of the state. And there are two people whose work particularly influenced us. One is Joseph Schumpeter, who is an Austrian economist some of you may have heard of. Another one much less known by 
econ by economists is a fellow called Charles Tilly, who wrote some seminal work on the rise of Western Europe. So why did Western Europe become the place where states grew and developed and subsequently, of course, became the place where the hockey stick began? Why did they become the states that took off around 1800? Now, what Tilly focused on was particularly the role of the state and the conduct of war being the reason why. What became different about Western Europe was state-led conflict became very entrenched at quite an early part in the history. And that meant states faced an existential threat. You either developed the capacity to have an army and to have revenues raised to do that, or basically your state would cease to exist. So state competition in Western Europe was his view about what was driving economic progress because the need of states to become strong and effective else they would cease to exist as effective states at all because they would be overrun by their competitor states. But what Tilly did, and I think this, so we, we found that a very fascinating hypothesis, but what he did was to focus almost exclusively on one dimension of so the state. So we, um, we, we really have tried to embrace this in our work. And then finally I want to talk briefly about political violence because this is a topic which has only come into economics again comparatively recently um, trying to understand the centrality for economic success of establishing peace and security again you would say most economists simply took it for granted that you could establish peace and security it wasn't part of what we studied why could how could you successfully do that and there's been a lot of work by economists in recent years on civil conflict, in particular contesting the right to govern in particular territories. And this has sort of led to a conundrum, which I want to come back to later, which is that if you look, conflict is most, civil conflict is most prevalent in low-income countries. Um, but is it that that causes low income, or is it a symptom of low income? It doesn't establish anything to see that there's that correlation, and I want to take that on a little bit later. Um, we've also learned in part of this research program is it's quite important not to just look at conflict in the form of, um, uh, of, of civil conflict, but also look at its alternatives. Are the alternatives peace or just repression? And this has, again, surfaced as a theme in the work uh, that uh, Torsten and I have done on political violence. Okay, so now let me now um, come to state capacities as we've tried to develop the idea in our own work. And we, as I say, we think of them as the assets that allow the state to function. And there are three kinds of state capacity that we focus on. We call them fiscal capacity, legal capacity, and collective capacity. And I'll, I'll unpack each of those very briefly. The key idea in our work is that these capacities are built up over time and are, are at the core of what we mean by a modern effective state. A modern effective state is going to have developed the asset base to, uh, to function on these dimensions. Um, and as I said earlier, we think they were neglected and we're trying in our research to put them more front and center in our understanding of economic growth. So let me begin with fiscal capacity. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through each of these capacities, although actually I'll just give you a little more on fiscal capacity because I have a nice picture to show you in a moment, which is really, I, at least for me, was an, was an eye-opener when I first saw it, or you've seen it already. Okay, uh, what do I mean by b building fiscal capacity? That's essentially the power to tax. That was what Tilly was talking about in his account of Western Europe in early medieval era, medieval era. How did governments get to get their hands on revenue to allow them to fight wars was essentially his point. We build effect, we build, the big story in the history of taxation is building broad-based taxes. Governments at an early stage of development tend to tax what they can. So trade taxes are relatively easy to raise because you can police your borders and you can look at the goods coming over your borders and you can choose how much to tax them. But the modern state, the states that we see in the world that can raise 30, 40% of GDP in the form of tax revenue, how are they doing it? 
They're basically doing it with two things, the personal income tax, taxing everybody's incomes, and VAT, broad-based consumption taxes. So if you're going to build a broad-based tax system, that's almost certainly where you're going to have to raise your revenues. But in order to do that, you know, everyone understands this. Where on earth are you going to get that capacity from? Well, effectively, you need to engage in monitoring and compliance. And the big innovation in the form of personal income taxes came in most countries in the middle of the last century, particularly during the Second World War. Well, what I have to do is I'm not going to rely on giving my citizens their incomes and then expecting them to hand them over to the state. I'm going to use direct withholding at source. But to do direct withholding, you need to build up a system of monitoring and compliance whereby businesses are willing to remit the income that their, their workers own to the central state. So you need to make these investments. There's a wonderful uh, book um, by John Brewer on the ability of Britain to develop um, fiscal capacity in the uh, 18th century, drawing the root maps of the uh, tax inspectors. So they would go, particularly in Yorkshire, which is the northern part of the UK, the tax inspector would have to go and raise taxes from different places. But they knew that they shouldn't show up predictably. So they had route maps that showed that each time they went out, they would change their route so nobody knew when the guy was coming so they couldn't be out. Okay, so this is the picture I want to show you. This is, this is the rise of the fiscal state in one picture. This takes only 18 countries. Um, in the world. So this is not a sample of the whole world. These are the sample of countries we've got reliable data on. And this, what this tells you is two things. There's two axes. On uh, the uh, vertical axis on the left-hand side is the average share of um, tax in aggregate income. Okay? And that's going to be the, the, the green line. What the green line shows you, if you went back to 1900, and most, a lot of these are quite de what we now call developed countries. as the UK, Sweden, Switzerland, and so forth. A around 10% of GDP was being raised in taxes. Joseph Schumpeter wrote an article around 1910 called The Crisis of the Tax State. He was saying in 1910, which is when this was about 10%, how on earth are governments going to be able to continue to keep raising 10% of GDP in the form of taxes? He thought this was an impossibility. Well, look at what happened in, in reality. In reality, over time, the average tax take in GDP went up and up and up until it's around somewhere 25 to 30%. It more than doubled. And in fact, as we know, in a number of countries like Sweden, it's up around 40%. So governments can, if they go about it, raise very significant sums. We know this from the incomes of their citizens. But what's the big story? It's the broad-based tax thing. You go back to 1900, and that's what the dotted line is here, the, sorry, the dashed line. Virtually none of this was being raised in the form of income taxes. The U.S. Didn't even made the income tax unconstitutional until the early part of the 20th century. There were no income taxes. It was against the Constitution. So that's the share of income tax in total taxes. So effectively what governments were doing was building the income. Effectively, legal capacity is the capacity of the state to protect property rights, to create a credible legal code enforced by an independent judiciary. And again, states over the period of history have, uh, have, uh, uh, have tried to build the institutional framework that allows them to do this. Resourcing courts and training legal professionals is absolutely essential to that as is building effectively, effective regulatory institutions with monitoring and compliance systems. I would personally put central banks, for example, in the building of legal capacity. I know that may be a stretch, but that's sort of where I would think of them as part of the broad regulatory frameworks that we have, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we need in, a, in, a, in an economy. And then finally is what we call collective capacity. This is the ability of the state, or the capacity of the state, to deliver with the spending that it does. Okay? So what does the state spend on? It spends on health programs, it spends on social security, education, supporting innovation, a very key role of the state. 
and designing, maintaining, and delivering infrastructure. You can't just assume the state's going to do that well. States are always looking at ways of trying to build the frameworks that allow us to deliver that. And I'll come back to it a little bit later, but I, in, recently in the UK, we set up an independent infrastructure commission to try and plan large-scale infrastructure projects. Uh, so we built a piece of state capacity in order to try and deliver better in an area of policy where we hadn't been succeeding. So these things, I would argue, all are about getting the structures right. Because if you're going to spend money without the structures in place, that money is unlikely to... to it, it may be a problem of misappropriation of waste, but the money is unlikely to go to the places where it's really needed. Okay, so those are the key kinds of state capacities. We would argue that if you're thinking about economic growth, all of these capacities are absolutely central. Fiscal capacity um, is needed to support the productive role of the state. You need money to spend on infrastructure. You need money to spend on education if you're going to have a growing economy. You need legal capacity because it supports a competitive market sector, the regulatory and competition framework that you have. You need the legal capacity to protect property rights. And then finally, you need collective capacity, crucially in my view, to share the proceeds of growth in a broad-based ba basis to create political sustainability. Because growth is most politically sustainable where all of the citizens can benefit from that growth. And having collective capacity is absolutely central, I would argue, to, to the sustainability of, gr of, of, of growth. And of course, that also contributes to growth to the extent that you, you enhance human capacities. People who are healthy and educated are more productive. So collective capacity also has that direct benefit onto economic growth. So we would argue, if you think about what the state can do to support the economy, state capacities capture well in these three different forms what states do to enhance uh, the economy and therefore generate growth. Now, we spent quite a bit of time uh, worrying about um, how to measure state capacities. And I'm not going to bore you with uh, an, a detailed account. Because what we're interested in is trying to get measures of how it is that states can support these different functions. So I'm just going to do something a bit arbitrary. What you'll have to believe me is the broad picture I'm going to show you on the next slide really doesn't depend on the specific measures that we use here. I'm going to measure collective capacity as an index based on school attainment and life expectancy. I'm going to use a, a measure of fiscal capacity, the share of income taxes in total revenue. And I'm going to use 1999 as my base year. And I'm going to use, for legal capacity, I'm going to look at an index of contract enforcement as measured by something that's quite well known to some of you, I'm sure, the World Bank's doing business indicator. So I'm going to take three very crude measures. It's the thing you'll have to believe me is if I took less crude measures or different crude measures at least, the picture I'm going to show you is rather similar. And this is what you get as a kind of three-dimensional plot. Now, that may look a little bit odd. You've got your legal capacity, fiscal capacity, and collective capacity on the three axes. What we've done here is to color the dots so that the red dots are the high-income countries in the world. The hollow dots are, uh, I guess they're not dots, they're hollow circles, uh, are um, middle-income countries, and the blue are the low-income countries. The one thing I want you to observe is among high-income countries, there's a real cluster to the top right-hand corner. High-income countries almost all have high, high state capacities on all three dimensions. But then there's some variability across countries. But to some extent, because we've now thought about the world this way, the big question is, and this is the whole research program we've been engaged in, is can we explain why different countries are in different places in this box? If we can, can we think of how, how to move countries around in this box? What would be the factors that drive countries into different places? What are the, what are the factors here? So the rest of what I want to talk about, oh, and I have the, the next picture is uh, um, Dr. Ali Chowdhury produced this one for us. This took the data from our book and did a state capacity measure for countries that are better or worse than Pakistan, according to these measures. And effectively what you see 
Uh, the green, as I said, is better than Pakistan. The red is worse. That Pakistan comes out relatively low on the state capacity measures that we use. Okay, what we, when we describe where you get state capacities from, we don't think investment in state capacity is fundamentally different from investment in any kind of asset. Um, it's about individuals, groups of individuals in the case of state capacities, getting together and thinking about how they can improve the workings of the system. So if you want to improve the collection of taxes, we heard earlier that you know, people form a tax commission, that's a good place to start. But you also need a plan of how to turn the proposals of a tax commission into real public action, which is maybe also uh, more than just having a plan, it's about knowing how to implement that plan. What's interesting about state capacity investments, like many investments, we think they're very long-term investments. So they require people to think forward in particular through government cycles, meaning that almost certainly if, a go if today's government really undertakes a major reform program to increase state capacities, it's very unlikely to be the government that's in place to benefit from having those improved state capacities. Because these are long-run investments. These are not things that are going to pay off before the next election, typically. So what it requires are far-sighted decisions by government Equally, legal capacity supports fiscal capacity. Uh, I think I've already, I've already said that, so let me, let me move on. So to summarize that, this is the picture that we use to talk about where fiscal and where the state capacities come from. I'm going to talk in a minute about what I mean by cohesiveness of political institutions. But basically, there are these three capacities. They affect the level and distribution of income and the degree of political stability and the nature of political institutions is going to play a role in building those capacities. The things that you may be able to change in the long run that are very hard to change in the short run are things like the culture and values of the population and things like the underlying cleavages. Are you a divided society through wealth, through other forms of, of, of division? And I'm not going to talk a huge amount about that now, but I will come back to it briefly uh, towards the end of my uh, lecture. So let me, I've, I've, I've so far talked, sort of hinted about the role of political institutions, but now I want to get to that topic a little more centrally. Um, why, are, why are political institutions important in this story? Well, principally they're important because they affect the incentives of government to build state capacities. Um, there are two key dimensions of political institutions um, and I think it's important to recognize the difference between them and to realize why I want to focus on the second of these, why that's the case. Before I do this, this is, I call it the history of the world in one slide. Um, this is basically using a database that uh, a lot of people who study these issues look at called the Polity 4 database. Polity 4 database was, uh, was created by a, a set of political scientists who wanted to map the nature of political institutions across the world over a, a long period of history. So they go back to 1800. And of course, there are relatively few independent states in 1800, so as time goes by, there are more and more independent states. What I've done here, they, a lot of people then tend to put those into a score which they call democracy. What I'm doing is resisting that temptation and actually keeping two different dimensions separate. I'm going to, choo I'm going to take openness to, of access to power. So think of this to the first order as do you have it to get the highest score on the openness measure, you need, to have a, you need to have open and free elections. Look at this measure. This is, a, this is my other measure. This is how much constrained power you have on the executive. That's the blue line. And the thing I want you to notice about that, it lags behind the red line consistently. It's much harder to build a system of courts and parliamentary oversight that works effectively than it is to build a system of running elections. Countries find it relatively easy to run elections. You can, get intellect, you can get international monitors in to make sure they're done freely and fairly. It's much harder to build real oversight of executive authority 
So you might have a parliament, but the parliament may be overruled by the executive if the parliament objects to what the executive is doing. You may have courts, but in many countries, courts are also overruled by governments when it doesn't suit them to obey what the rules are. This is much harder. So even by the end of the 20th century, only around 40% of countries around the world, and by now you've got 220 countries in the data at the end of this, only about a quarter of those, uh, only about 40% of those countries are getting the highest score for constrained executives. And this for us is going to be a key part of why we think there's been incomplete um, uh, um, building of state capacities. I'm going to tie this back. Because what the, what the executive constraints do is to provide that continuity, that constraint on what governments do to provide all governments with reassurance that if they build an effective state, the benefits of that effective state are going to be shared more broadly. And to the extent you have the capacity to have cohesion in the use of state power, that's going to encourage you to build a stronger and more sustainable state. That's absolutely at the core of the logic of investment that I laid out earlier. Now, the idea of executive constraints goes back a long way. J.S. Mill uh, was one of the key writers on this. He talked about the establishment of constitutional checks by which the consent of the community or a body of some sort supposed to represent an interest was made a necessary condition to some of the more important acts of the governing power. Absolutely fundamental principle of government that people should constrain the use of power. In the Polity 4 database, something we've noticed, this database that I showed you earlier, that judicial independence and our, our, uh, our uh, chief guest here, I'm sure this will relate very strongly to your own career uh, as a justice, um, the independence of the judiciary, absolutely crucial to the role of um, constraining executive power in, 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 in states. Um, okay. Now, our argument and our central argument is if you look at how did those states in the top right-hand corner of the box earlier, those red dots become those red dots, there's a central role, we believe, in the process of building state capacity and having strong constraints on executive powers. And that's because groups feel that they are better treated, and this is the key, the key thing, that groups are better treated in such states even when they aren't in power. And I'll talk about a bit of evidence that I've created with, with one of my co-authors later. But the, what we call a common interest state is one that those who feel that they're not currently represented directly in the, in the government rely on the institutions, the executive constraint institutions, to represent their interests nonetheless through judicial and parliamentary process. Um, I'll skip that. Um, so the key question becomes, and this is the hard question, how do you then go about building strong executive constraints? If you do buy the argument that they are lying at the core of building state capacities of the kind that deliver for their citizens, then where does it come from? Well, one view, I mean, not an unrespectable view, is a long historical struggle. So that anybody who knows their history of the United Kingdom would realize it took hundreds of years to arrive at a situation with strong executive constraints. The UK, for many years of its history, was plagued by civil wars. Uh, every time a monarch died, you basically had to, had to re-establish who was going to inherit the throne. And in fact, uh, it wasn't really until the, the uh, what we call now the, the Civil War, of course it wasn't the Civil War, there was a war in the, uh, in the 17th century, uh, the king challenged the right of parliament. So, brief history of the UK to see roughly how this happened. You, you'll recall Magna Carta, whose 800th anniversary was last year. Magna Carta established that the king could raise taxes only with the consent of parliament. Well, kings didn't really like that very much because that was a bit of a constraint on their power. So kings several times wanted to do away with parliamentary oversight. Well, things came to a head in the, uh, quite a few hundred years later in the 17th century 
when the king basically wanted to dismiss parliament uh, and raise taxes outside of parliamentary oversight. That led to a civil war. The king lost his head, literally, in the end of that process. And never again was there any doubt that it would be parliament and not the king who would have the right to raise taxes. So that was a back and forth process which eventually established executive constraints of the executive in that, in that case was the king but later became the prime minister was the head of the executive but took many 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 years. Now I think therefore we should learn from history. What do we learn? We learn unless we build the kind of strong parliaments and give them the tools that they need to hold the executive to account, it's very unlikely that that's going to, uh, going, we're going to have strong executive constraints. Unless we have strong and independent judicial systems and other independent institutions, of which I would put central banks quite high on the list, that, that are able to work with government in a democratic setting, so you can do it with the usual democratic uh, structures in place, but based on rule-based government. Now, this is why Torsten, so I was saying Torsten and I in our recent work have been more drawn to the role of what we call norms and values. Um, so, it, so one view which, which has become very popular among people who study this is it's all about rules. But if it was all about rules, there would be no puzzle here. We can change the rules anytime we want. Somebody could wake up tomorrow and pass a rule you know, whatever they chose to do. What's much harder to know is which rules get obeyed and why are they obeyed? And are they the right rules that are obeyed? So I have a personal example. I'm going to use a central bank example since uh, uh, you know, we're particularly given the lecture but also given my own experience. I was elected to be a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee um, and so I said to someone, what are the rules? What do I have to do? And they gave me a copy of the Bank of England Act, which created the Independent Monetary Policy Committee. And it turned out, I looked in the Act, it was two pages. And it just said, um, you have to show up to some meetings. It didn't say anything about what I had to even do at those meetings. It didn't say anything about, I think, e even voting may have not even been in the Act. And I, certainly the voting rule wasn't in the Act. So how did I find out about what my job was about? I went to the central bank and I said, how does this actually work? And they said, oh, we have all of these meetings, you get together, we discuss the economy, and then at the end of that we vote and that's what, what happens to interest rates. But almost everything of any importance or significance was not written down, was not part of the rules. Almost everything of importance was in the norms and conventions that we were using. Now, of course, that's good news and bad news because when the financial crisis came, it was much harder maybe to change those norms and conventions rapidly enough to be able to respond to a crisis. In fact, we did. We had to have extra meetings. We had, uh, on one, one occasion, we cut interest rates jointly with the Fed and the Bank of Japan and the ECB. We had to violate our norms to do that. We didn't have to violate the rules, but just the norms. We had to have a special meeting that we agreed to do. The point I'm trying to make here is rules really are almost certainly not going to give you the answer. You can say we want a parliament. You can say the rule is that the parliament can vote down what the executive does. But what really matters is how you evolve a set of norms and values to support those rules. And that's what makes changing executive constraints much more, much, much more difficult. So when there was the fight in the 17th century between parliament and the king, it was not a fight over the rules. The king didn't want to abolish parliament. The king wanted to abolish the norm that had arisen that parliament was needed to raise taxes because the king wanted to have direct access to raising taxes. So again, it was really a fight over the norms and not over the rules. Well, here's a, 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 a picture of the Polity 4 data for Pakistan. So in terms of the rules, and this is the Polity 4 interpretation, and I really hesitate to put this up here, partly because everybody in the room knows far more about Pakistan probably than the people who wrote, who codify the data, and certainly than I do. But this is what the Polity 4 guys say is the history of executive constraints the for Pakistan. Of the world as a whole. Pakistan is actually 
a little worse than the global experience. But the question I'm going to pose for you, and this is rather a question than giving you an answer, is how well does this represent the reality of executive constraints in Pakistan? So when one's thinking about to what extent is there the capacity of the, of, of, of the executive to be held to account, and is that an issue in building the kinds of state capacities that Pakistan needs? These are the kinds of data that Torsten and I have been looking at, but is this a good way of looking at at that. So it's really more to, to, to change that. So we move on. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few more things and we'll stop for some Q&A if people would like to do that. Um, I want to talk a bit about staying on the theme of executive constraints. I want to talk about a bit of research that I've done with Hannes Muller, which I think is quite relevant to some of the issues we've talked about. Uh, and I want to end on that. The, sec the first of these is to talk about the role of political violence and intergroup inequality and the way executive constraints play a role there. And the other is the way executive constraints play a role in reducing political risk. So if we go to the next slide. As I said earlier, one thing that we brought into the ambit of this research program is thinking about how the state copes with the threat of, of violence, particularly from internal political forces. And one thing that we've argued uh, in our book was that strong executive constraints play a crucial role in diminishing the, use of, uh, the need for political violence because it creates more cohesion in the, in the pol political system. So one thing I did in some recent work with, um, with Hannes Muller was to notice that you can use, and this is some very recent tools that people have started using in economics, the measures of regional distribution of GDP using satellite imagery. So one thing you don't often have for different countries is a picture of how well off different parts of the country are. Uh, country is. Turns out by using satellite images from space, you can look at the areas of the country that are lit up. So the most wonderful version of this is North and South Korea. If you look at a picture of North and South Korea at night, everything south is lit up at night, basically. Everything north is dark. Well, and everything is an exaggeration, but you really see patterns of economic development. So people have been increasingly using these space-based images. So what we've done in this research, we weren't the people to do the primary data collection, is to look at the way in which light is correlated with the distribution of the residents of different ethnic groups in society. Okay? And you can create measures of regional inequality by ethnic group across the world. And there's a database now that allows you to look across different countries, look at where income is distributed through this imagery, through, through nightlight, and compare that with different ethnic homelands. Now one thing that we observed in our research is if you then look at countries that have strong and weak executive constraints, you see a very striking fact you get much less regional inequality in countries with strong executive constraints. Suggesting that one thing that cohesive institution is doing for you is giving you a more even distribution of income. And that's particularly true in countries uh, where you have some groups that are not part of the ruling coalition. If you're not going to be part of the ruling coalition, you do much better being in a country in which there are strong executive constraints. And we think this is a big part of the story about why political violence is diminished in countries with strong executive constraints. Because groups feel like they have a stronger stake in what the state is doing in countries with strong constraints. We go to the next slide. Here's a picture again, and, and, and I haven't really developed this theme very much in the lecture, but here's a, theme, a picture again that comes out of our book. Um, where we looked at political violence in countries across the world um, and thinking about the forces. And again, I just put this up uh, for, for, uh, for Pakistan here. Um, and Pakistan is, again, there are about a third of the way up the distribution. About 45 countries are worse and about 105 countries are better in terms of the history of... Uh, remember when I first drew this picture, I was amazed uh, by it. 
Now I'm going to try and make you amazed by it because you're looking at it and you're thinking, what, what am I trying to show you here? What this is is a plot of the distribution of growth rates in countries which have strong and weak executive constraints. The strong executive constraints countries are in blue and the weak executive constraints countries are in red. So what's the picture telling you? Is the distribution of growth rates is much less risky in countries that have strong executive constraints and much more dispersed in countries that have weak executive constraints. Now of course there's some good news and bad news. Where is China in here? China is up here. China is a very high performing weak executive constraints country. But equally you might have some place like Zimbabwe down here which is a very poorly performing weak executive constraints country. But what you buy yourself by adopting strong executive constraints it appears is a lot less risky um, profile of your growth performance. Now does that matter? So we should go to the next slides. Well what we argue in the research we do is that what strong executive constraints do is provide a kind of insurance in the policy making process. If the executive is going to make poor policy decisions or you're going to elect poor policy makers what you can do is to constrain the use of their power to reduce the riskiness of economic policy making. And again independent central banks I would say are a very important institution in trying to reduce the riskiness of policy making. Um, so we, we argue that executive constraints are particularly important in managing bad r downside risks in the economy. So you can't, if your economy is being hit by shocks, you need to manage those downside risks. And almost all of the poorly performing economies in the world are those that have weak executive constraints with large n episodes of negative growth. So what's the benefits therefore of moving to strong executive constraints on that basis? Um, well we looked at, and this again is some work with Hannes Muller, we looked at what happens to a country's FDI, foreign direct investment, after it makes a transition to strong executive constraints. And this picture here shows that basically you get an immediate dividend in the form of the foreign direct investment following on after a period where you strengthen your executive constraints. And we think that that is due to the fact that you get a lot less volatility and foreign investors care a huge amount about political risk and you get a diminution of political risk following a transition to strong executive constraints which is what drives these investment flows. And I'll show you one more picture if you go to the next slide. This, when I first saw this picture it amazed me. This, so this is a picture of global flows of foreign direct investment. The blue line is foreign indirect investment into high strong executive constraints countries. The red line is the flow of investment into weak executive constraint countries. This picture also shows you what we mean when we talk about globalization. I remember the first time I think I ever heard the word globalization and that was in 1995. I remember one of my colleagues telling me, oh we need to start studying globalization. I didn't even know what he meant. Well I now know what he meant. Look at what happens after 1995 to flows of foreign direct investment. It basically takes off mightily after that period. That's really a symptom of what we mean by the global, uh, globalization in the form of investment flows around the world. What's striking about this is you only benefit from globalization of this kind if you were a strong executive constraints country. Basically the countries that did not have strong executive constraints got almost no benefit from foreign direct investment. So it really goes only to those kinds of countries. Okay, now I'm just going to wrap up. Um, what I've tried to encourage you to think in terms of is I guess to use a very traditional economics of framework inputs, outputs and intermediate goods. Um, what are the outputs? The outputs are the things that make our citizens better off. They're having better incomes but human capabilities more broadly. Access to sanitation, uh, health care and the rest. What are the intermediate goods? The intermediate goods are things like 
peace and security and state capacities. The key input I've wanted to focus on is in order to benefit from those intermediate inputs, there's a, we believe, very strong evidence, and I would say also very strong logic and theoretical uh, reasoning that says strong exec constraints on executive power are absolutely crucial to building peace and security and building strong state capacities so that we can have more of the outputs that we care about, which are incomes and human capabilities. So I believe as a sort of corollary of that, that thinking about state capacities is absolutely pivotal. But I think what I've learned from that agenda is we need to go back and think about perhaps a harder but equally fundamental question. How can we build the kinds of constrained, rule-based, but with strong norms and values backing them up, forms of government that can allow us to build uh, state capacities? Finally, I'll just mention briefly, so we ran something in 2012 called the LSE Growth Commission. The LSE Growth Commission was aimed at trying to identify priorities for long-run growth in the UK. We were particularly, we set it up in part because everybody was obsessed by the financial crisis. And of course, the financial crisis was an important thing. We're not saying it wasn't. But we, were, we said, look, policymakers, you know, you may be in the financial crisis, but don't forget all the long-run challenges. And we came out with a whole series of, um, of uh, proposals uh, for how the government should change um, uh, policy and institutions. And one of those we came up with was the idea of having a National Infrastructure Commission. Nothing happened then for a couple of years. But in 2015, after the Conservative government won the election, uh, they, they basically waited a couple of months because actually the Labour Party adopted our idea in their manifesto. So the opposition was running on having an a, a, a independent infrastructure commission, but the government was not. So we thought, well, maybe then the government won the election, so we thought maybe that's the end of that. But in 2015, the government said, no, we're going to actually have a National Infrastructure Commission. I was selected as a commissioner on the first, uh, in, in the first commission, and we're now working on infrastructure projects. Now, why do I raise this? Well, I think what we're doing is two things. We are part of state capacity. We are trying to improve the capacity of government to analyze the infrastructure needs, to think about where the financing is going to come from, to think about where the funding has come from. So we're part of state capacity. I'd like to think of it that way. It's like, of course I would, because that's what I do in my day job as an academic. But also, actually, we're part of executive constraints. Because our job, and this is the reason why the LSE Growth Commission recommended this idea, is we thought that the parliamentary cycle got in the way of long-run investments. Governments would run and then lose an election and then some plan that the previous government had thought was a good idea, the next government didn't think was a good idea. And we said this was getting in the way of long-run investments in infrastructure. So the idea is the role of the Infrastructure Commission is to persuade all politicians to reach a consensus view on what are the infrastructure priority needs for the economy so we can break out of the electoral cycle. So I guess to finish on, there was a piece of both building state capacity and building executive constraints simultaneously. It's too early to say whether or not our projects that we're recommending are going to be successfully implemented. But I guess at the time, I didn't occur to me as much as it